Yeah. Hi. Uh, so thanks for the invitation. As always, it's fun to be back in KITP. Um, today I will talk about, um, uh, uh, mo mo for the first half, mostly work with, um, with Ahmed and Shi, who are both here. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'll have time to talk about recent work with uh, Fernando Pastowski, who's here somewhere. I don't know, is he Fernando? Yeah, there he is. Yeah, my collaborator. And uh, Benny Yoshida, who is in, in Japan with his newborn child, and uh, John Preskill, uh, who apparently is in DC trying to get us money. Um, uh, and I guess there was also uh, some related work recently by Eric, Joe, and Vlad, which I guess Vlad will talk about uh, tomorrow. Um, okay. So uh, ADS-CFT is supposed to be a quantum statement, uh, you know, a statement about operators and states in Hilbert space, uh, although it's true that most ADS-CFT talks one, go one goes to are involve solving classical gravity equations. Um, how does it work? Well, so the, you know, the basic idea is that, um, well, states uh, in the Hilbert space uh, on the bulk side correspond to states in the boundary Hilbert space, uh, vice versa. I guess I, I would be inclined to say it's a definition. I guess that was one of the ways Steve was talking about thinking about these kinds of things. Um, then uh, obviously the, you know, things like the, sim the various symmetry generators act in the same way, um, you know, in the Hilbert space. So the Hamiltonian is the ADM Hamiltonian and so on and so forth. Um, but then the, the thing that I'm going to be uh, starting from today um, is another line in the dictionary which says that if I take a, a local bulk field um, and I extrapolate it to the boundary uh, with some uh, scaling factor, uh, then I get a local operator uh, in the CFT. Um, uh, this is something I guess that uh, Douglas and I started calling the extrapolate dictionary. Uh, and here I'll, I'll give it a name... Uh, Smiley face. <laughs> I learned that from Shamit. Um, now, I mean, this is great um, if you live at asymptotic infinity. Um, we don't live at asymptotic infinity, so it would be nice if we could uh, back off of this uh, a little bit and see if we can define things that are, you know, right inside of the box. So, you know, even, even though we could, we could talk about about scattering, you know, experiments like that, you know, it would be nice if we could talk about what's going on right in the question mark. You know, that would be some, you know, that would be a step along the way to understanding things like, you know, the interiors of black holes or cosmology where we don't always have the, op the luxury of, of describing everything from the boundary. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to think about it in this the most stupid <coughs> way possible. You know, can I just back off of this limit a little bit? and talk about something like these operators, you know, deep inside the bulk. So, so fortunately, we just had a nice talk um, by Dan about this, uh, which I'll, of course, assume that you all mastered the content of. Um, uh, but, you know, there are two complaints that people usually make. Both of them, of course, came up during Dan's talk, but I want to say them again to emphasize them. So, 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 we, so we'd like to back off. Um, <coughs> Um, pro problem number one is um, that there exists um, diff invariance. Um, so there's no such thing as local bulk operators. Uh, and that's sometimes used as a, as a criticism of, of trying to back this off. Um, that's sort of a less serious criticism. It's, of course, a true criticism. Um, but it can be dealt with by gauge fixing. So I'm, I'm now usually when I give this talk, that's all I say about it, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, view gauge fixing as some sort of perverse uh, thing that you know you, you only do if you have no other choice. Um, now, since there's been so much discussion about it at the workshop, I will say a little bit more about it uh, later. Um, you know, it's, it, this has to do with the dressing, gravitational dressing. Um, but then there's a there's a more serious complaint, um, which is that um, there exist black holes, um, you know, and there there exists the holographic entropy bound, um, and you know that tells us that in the end, uh, you know, entropies at very high energies have to scale like areas and not like volumes, uh, and that's got to put some kind of limitation on uh, the existence of these operators. Okay, now. Um, 
nonetheless, my you know local effective field theory seems pretty good in this room. You know, there, so there's got to be at least some sense in which it's valid in ADS-CFT. Um, and so, so following what Dan talked about, I'm going to take the attitude of you know let let's just ignore this for a while and see how far we can get. Okay, see see, see how far we can get ignoring this. Uh, before, before we get into trouble and, and we can't, uh, we can't ignore it anymore. So, so that that philosophy um, has a has a long history, and so here I'll write some series of letters. Um, oh, let's see, H K L L, uh, H M P S, uh, and I'll include M here too. Um, so this is this is Banks, uh, Douglas, Horowitz, and Martinek. Uh, this is Hamilton, Kabat, Lifshitz, and Lowe. This is Heemskirk, Merrill, Polchinski, and Sully. And this is Ian Morrison. And so, you know, some, you know, order one fraction of those people are sitting in the audience. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, they can chime up if I misrepresent their work. So, so the idea of these people um, gradually refined as we go down this list um, is that we look for a set of operators, phi, um, which obey two things. So, so first, so first we want to find some some CFT operator phi, which which um, obeys a bulk um, equations of motion. Uh, now, how do we know the bulk equations of motion? Well, as we as was discussed yesterday, the easiest way to do that is you just look at the set of boundary correlation functions, compare them to feynman witten diagrams, and invert the map. There's a lot of literature about that. Um, so once you know them, then you look for a phi. Uh, that obeys them, um, but then you also want it um, to obey a uh, smiley face. Uh, and well, the good news about that is that um, you know the bulk equations of motion are, are partial differential equations, and um, and smiley face is a, is a boundary condition for partial differential equation. Uh, so we might think that we were able to solve it, um, and uh, indeed that's what people do. So. Uh, um, when you do that, you find yourself writing down these kinds of formulas um, that Dan was writing. Uh, um, where now, you know, as usual, it's more easily understood with a picture. Um, so, so here's some bulk point little x where the where the phi is going to be. Um, and then I, I look at the set of boundary points that are, that are space-like separated. So you don't have to do it this way, but this is one nice way of doing it. Um, uh, and then I define R as this, this boundary region of things you know, that, are, that are separated. And then this capital X is a boundary point that I'm, I'm integrating over this region. Uh, and this K is something which obeys the, the free wave equation, since I'm first working to leading order in 1 over n. Um, and then uh, it's, uh, it, it's arranged so that it's the solution where when I bring x to the boundary, it, k becomes a delta function, and we recover this. So, so, so this you can do. I mean, this is no big mystery. You can do it explicitly. Um, and then you can include uh, corrections, order by order and 1 over n, via some series of diagrams where, you know, so it, maybe this diagram looks like that, so I've got this k here. Um, and then, you know, if there's a cubic term or something, then there'll be a diagram like that, uh, and so on. So, so it just becomes sort of Feynman diagramology to work out the one over n corrections to this. Now, it's interesting that, for example, um, I, I, I could have even done this <coughs> using the wrong equations of motion, you know, if I were not very intelligent. Um, and you could ask what could go wrong. I could still write down these <coughs> operators that obey the wrong equations of motion in the CFT uh, by construction, because I'm just solving this PDE with boundary conditions. Um, but as Dan explained in his talk yesterday, there is something that can go wrong, um, and that's the algebra of the operators. So for example, um, I can look in the ground state, you know, stick in some phi's, you know, um, and then I can put in a commutator of two phi's, um, and then you know, put in a few more phi's. Um, and look at look at this expectation value, and maybe maybe this phi will be at little x, this one will be at little y, um, and we can be in the situation where these are space like separated, um, and then um, if the the bulk algebra would uh, tell you, well, 
naively it would tell you that it's zero. Slightly more carefully it would tell you that it's zero up to, uh, up to Gauss law um, things. Um, but it, it tells you what it is. You don't, you don't get, you know, and, 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 if, and if I'd solved the wrong equations of motion, I'd have gotten this wrong. Okay. Um, so for now, let's just say it's zero. Let's say, you know, let's say we're working at a low enough order in 1 over n that it's zero. And then I promise, again, I'll, I'll later discuss how what I say is fixed up uh, to include the gravitational dressing. Um, so, 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 you know, so you can check in, in special cases, as Dan was explaining, you know, you don't act with too many phi's here. You can compute this explicitly and see that it's zero. Now, you could ask, though, how big is the set of states where this can be zero or, or small? You know, maybe, maybe it'll be e to the minus 1 over n squared and not zero, but, but, but small, okay? Um, well, th this was something that, that she and Ahmed and I, I think, were able to um, elucidate. Uh, so, so let's ask an even simpler question. Um, so let, let's think about, a, you know, so here, here's, some, here's some bulk spatial slice here. And let, let's think about some operator phi of x sitting in the center. Um, now, you might say, well, OK, so th this, this operator in the center here is space-like separated from any local operator on this boundary Cauchy slice, like let's say, say this one here, O of capital X. So, so you might say that suggests um, that, that phi of x with uh, O of big X um, is zero. You might say bulk causality requires that. So you can ask, okay, so okay, that, that's sort of the strongest thing you could ask. So, you know, sort of for all O of x, right, this is zero as an operator equation. The you want to make some restriction on O, like it's local? Lo local. Lo I wrote an X there. So it's a local gauge invariant operator in the CFT. But I mean, right now, for example, I'm including very high dimension operators, which you could question. And so I'm going to I'm going to fix that up in a minute. But for now, let's just imagine it works for all of the local O's. Um, well, this, so this, this is actually, th th this you actually can't have. OK. So there's a, there's a principle in quantum field theory. Now, this principle, sometimes it's called a theorem, sometimes it's called an axiom. Um, in, uh, in Streeter and Whiteman, it's called an axiom. So I'm going to use I'm going to use that term. It's called the time slice axiom. And what the time slice axiom says um, is that any bounded operator in a quantum field theory, not necessarily a local operator, so any bounded operator in the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory. Um, has the property that um, if uh, oh, a, that for any epsilon greater than zero, so here this is Streeter and Whiteman for you, um, we take we take some Cauchy slice in the CFT and we look at a strip of thickness epsilon, um, and then the claim is that if um, so l now let's consider some some local operator phi, which <coughs> is which is which is localized within the strip. So you know, for being rigorous, it's integrated against a C infinity function of compact support, whose support is entirely inside of the strip. Epsilon extends in time. Yes. Yes. So so oh, it, yeah, the name of this is the time slice axiom. I guess Hogg calls it primitive causality, but I, I like this more. Um, then the claim is that um, if the commutator of B and phi sub f is zero for all phi sub f that are in that are in the strip, then B is proportional to the identity. Okay. Now the intuition for this is fairly straightforward. Um, it's saying that the the set of local fields on a fixed time slice in a relativistic quantum field theory acts irreducibly in the Hilbert space. Okay. So to give a naive version of that, right? Like say I have some scalar field theory and you know the states are labeled by smooth field configurations. That's some complete basis of the low energy Hilbert space. Then if I act on this with some integral over a space, alpha of x, p of x, where p is the momentum conjugate to phi, um, 
then this is phi of x plus alpha of x, right? So, so by acting with local operators, I can get from one element of the basis to any other element of the basis. That means the local operators act irreducibly, and therefore by Schur's lemma, anything that computes with everything in an algebra that acts irreducibly um, must be proportional to the identity. Now, are you going to complain about the exponential? I was about to say something about it. No, I was going to ask, um, by your extrapolate dictionary, these local operators in ADS-CFT would just be doing things near the boundary. So, 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 where is it? So, that um, seems like it's not acting irreducibly. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're well, I, I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, so, so I, I'm going to, non local combinations of them might not be near the boundary, right? I mean, um, but you're, you, you just have products of them. And so, I mean, I mean, uh, no, or some sums of products. Sums of products. Sums of products. But that's still sums of products. So, of, so, of, well, of, let's of, think of about a spin. Let's think about a spin system, for example. Yeah, yeah. So, say I have a spin chain. Yes, yes. Then it's a theorem that every operator on the Hilbert space is a sum of products of right, poly right, yeah, operators yeah, 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 acting yeah, yeah, on yeah, the original. Yeah, so, so that's the that's the but that's the intuition uh, right, for, right. for 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 no, this. Uh, this axiom yeah. it conflicts with bulk locality. So you can maybe can recover bulk locality approximately. I mean, that's what I mean. It just conflicts. Well, right? I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so yeah, we, we can fight over whether this is a correct property of Lorenz invariant quantum field theories. Maybe on this note, I'll quote a, 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 an unnamed senior physicist um, <laughs> who, who I asked. Um, specifically, I asked him if it was true in non-abelian gauge theory, which is a question that I've been discussing with some people. Um, his response was, um, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> of course it's true in non-abelian gauge theory. I'm not sure why we're still talking about this. <laughs> okay. So actually, yeah. as long as we're being technical, let me this yeah. <laughs> if, if I, I mean, this axiom is false in theories with super selection sectors. Right? That's um, the definition of a super yeah. So good. So I think I'm 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 thinking of a sphere here. <coughs> yeah. And so then we so there's no IR. Uh, we don't expect no no super selection sectors. sectors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then are you going to come back to whether locality in the bulk really demands that? Of course. Area? That's the whole point. Of course. No, of course. The whole point of the talk is why it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So so what this tells us now, assuming that it's true, which I will assume, following my the advice of my elders. Um, is that um, the that bulk causality um, um, is not equal to um, an operator equation? Okay, where whereas in, in quantum field theory it is. Okay, so this is a a statement about you know quantum gravity. Um, so of course bulk causality. Well, it, it seems like it's controlled by an operator equation in this room. And so the, go the goal is to, is to explain that, uh, despite this inconvenient fact. Um, there, uh, so you might think this axiom is not true, say, order by order and one over n? Well, you have to be very careful about using words like order by order and one over n when you're talking about operator equations. Because yeah. when you talk about a small correction to an true. operator equation, you mean it's small in any state. True. But, you think that in some sense of defining order by order one over n, you could probably violate this thing at each um, order in one yeah, over n. Yeah, well, uh, roughly I'm going to be doing that, but it's going to involve looking at only certain subspaces of states. No, I want to better yeah. answer this question. I mean, yeah. the bulk causality, <coughs> micro-causality, is how we expect that to, to be true. Good, good, in good. Quote, as Absolutely. An operator equation, Absolutely. Order one over n. Absolutely, and I'm going to fix that in a sec. So just. Uh, I'm, I'm going to fix. I'm going to include the gravitational dressing in the statement. That doesn't help. Um, sorry, sorry. So we do we do expect. Sorry. Um, well, the thing the thing I will I, w I will update this for the fact that actually this operator doesn't commute with things here because of the dressing. Is that yeah, what you were worried I, I, about? I, that's not what I'm worried about. Oh, okay. What are you worried about then? I'm worried about the fact that at finite n, we don't expect the light cones to be well defined in the ball. Absolutely. We know when things are at the Absolutely. Same so there's going to be a plus order e to the minus n squared in all statements that I make. Right. Yes. So, so it, it seems. So like the qu right. The question is whether this is stable under small perturbations. So yeah. can can the commutator, you know, if you have an operator whose commutator is e to the minus n squared with some local operators, right. is that enough? Right. I don't think so. 
this is a question of, you know, so if, if, if I, I, think, I think a generalized Schur's version of Schur's lemma follows, where you say that if the operator norm of the commutator, you, you, you take the largest commutator normalized by the norms of the operators in the operator norm, and you say that's less than epsilon, then I think that it means that this operator is going to be equal to the identity up to something which is of order epsilon in the operator norm. I haven't proven that, though, but I think probably some statement like that is true. It would be interesting to understand what really is true. Yeah, it's on, it's on my list to try and prove the, the small corrections version of uh, Schur's lemma. Absolutely. No, I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. But isn't it sort of obvious that it can't be true as an operator statement because of the fact that we know what the states are that make up black holes, which are the high energy spectrum? Yeah, yeah. So this, this, is, this, is, this is, right. So that's, that, this is the correct yes. objection number two. So I'm trying to give a more rigorous uh, statement of that intuition. But yes, absolutely. Okay. I, this should not be a surprise. You know, I'm just trying to formalize it. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, good. Um, now, um, I can sharpen this a bit by introducing um, a new technique, um, which is called Rindler reconstruction. Um, which, which was explained sort of first by Hamilton, Kabat, Lifshitz, and Lowe, and then I think, I think sort of beautifully uh, by Ian Morrison just last year. Um, so the idea is that, um, you know, this global reconstruction, this thing over here is called the global reconstruction. It's the, it's the representation of this operator on the entire boundary, right? So here it has extent in time, but you could use the Hamiltonian to evolve it back to a single Cauchy slice in the boundary, and it would be an operator with support everywhere on the boundary. So that's called global reconstruction. Um, what these guys pointed out and what Ian refined is that uh, there's, there can be other representations of this operator with support only on a subregion of the boundary. Um, so, so the way this works um, is you, uh, you, you pick your subregion. So here I'll draw, I'll draw an ADS3 just because I'm technically challenged. Um, so here, here's, some, here's some boundary region. Uh, the idea is you look at its boundary domain of dependence, which will be some diamond here, um, D of A. Um, and then um, you look in the bulk at the, the intersection of the future and the past of this diamond. And that, and that wedge, this sort of wedge of cheese is called the causal wedge. I guess that I think is defined by Mugen and Veronica. Um, so, and then the point is that, you know, I won't, I won't tell you the details, but if this operator X is in the causal wedge of some region A, um, then it has another representation where the boundary integral is just over D of A. Um, and then there's some other smearing function, not the same smearing function. Um, o of X, um, again, plus order one over N. There's a subtlety here, which I guess these guys noted, and then I think was explained nicely by Vladimir and Stefan, and maybe also with Sujong, um, about how these Ks can't really be functions. They don't exist as smooth functions. Um, I think what, what Ian explained was, was how to understand them as distributions and how that doesn't violate, you know, that, that that's good enough uh, in, for saying that these guys have good representations in the subregion. Okay, so th this is maybe a little more intuitive if we look at it from above. Um, so, so say A is here, and now I'm, I'm just looking at this slice from the top. So, so here's the causal wedge. Um, and then if I have some operator, if I say X is here and Y is here. And then the claim is that um, there exists a representation of, of phi um, of X, um, but not um, uh, phi A of Y because this one's not in the causal wedge. So, so this picture you should just remember. You don't have to worry about the temporal extent of these things anymore. I'm just, from now on, I'll just be talking about the picture. OK, so good. Now let's see what kind of trouble we can get into with that. Um, OK, so, so now let's, uh, again, so now let's, for example, think about this central operator. Um, and now let's pick, I don't know, um, I don't know, David, where's your favorite local operator? How about here? Is that okay? <laughs> let's put it here. Boundary <laughs> local operator. Just some boundary local operator. And, and here's my phi of x in the center here. Well, I, I can choose a Rindler wedge where I just do that. 
and then I extend A the long way around, okay? So that this guy lives um, just in that wedge. And now this representation of phi does commute with O, exactly, in the CFT, um, by boundary causality. Um, and, and so then it, it, it's true for any O, no matter how high dimension it is, you know, or how, how, how non-semi-classical it is, this representation is still gonna commute with it. Um, but, you know, of course, you could have picked your, you know, your favorite local operator to be over here instead. Um, and I could have done that. And I would have been able to come up with some representation of this operator that also commutes exactly with that one. And now, if these representations are all equal, we again find ourselves um, in trouble with the time slice axiom. Um, now, okay, you might say, fine, they're not equal. From the bulk point, yeah. That there's this, this, this business about commutators. I mean, it's interesting that you need to use this, this Riddler case where this smearing function doesn't really exist and it's a distribution, right? But it's some kind of UV issue, right? And, and it could be that understanding those technicalities more physically would, would I think I, I would I would like to I would like to understand them better. Yeah, I mean the, the, they have to do with what's going on in the corners here, because the because the Rindler cutoff doesn't play very well with the with the global cutoff. Um, you, usually, right? So so I mean naively you would say that this operator is an operator that lives on the Hilbert space of the CFT on the hyperbolic uh, plane, not not an operator that lives in the Hilbert space of the circle, and so I have to regulate it to interpret it as an operator in the circle Hilbert space. And then the claim is that, um, you know, what the distributional arguments tell you is that you won't get into too much trouble if you do that. That, that if, you, if you use it when in... you take these commutators, though, it's a little um, Well, I don't know. I'm not putting the operators near the corner. I mean, I, I'm being careful not to do that. So, uh, I mean, I, 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 nonetheless, I agree. It would be, I think this is an important thing to understand better uh, for, for several reasons. Yes? I think this is a trivial question, but uh, the phi of x is the correct bulk field uh, in the sense that if you look at, say, the positive frequency modes, it annihilates the Minkowski vacuum, even though it's been you know, constructed based on the Ringler. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, so that was going to be my next comment, was that from the bulk point of view, if, at least if you think in perturbation theory, these operators are all equal because they're just Bogolubov transformations. So, so that, that's why it shouldn't be totally obvious. I mean, that's why you shouldn't just accept completely unthinkingly that these operators aren't equal in the CFT. In, in the low-energy Hilbert space, they're equal by Bogolubov transformations. Um, okay. So, okay. So that, that's some some. So, so now now let me give an, another example, which I also like. Um, so, now let's cut the boundary into three regions: um, A, B, and C. And now let's think about this operator in the center again. So now this operator is not in the causal wedge of A. It's not in the causal wedge of B, nor is it in the causal wedge of C. So it has no representation on any one of these, but it does have representation on A union B, or A union C, or B union C. So that's a little funny, right? So for example, if we somehow were fantasizing that these were all the same operators, then they would have to have the same spatial support in the CFT, and then their support would somehow just be these three points, which would be ridiculous. And if it's, it would be ridiculous isn't enough for you, then we could just rotate it a little bit, and now the, the support would be empty. So, 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 so somehow, again, these all can't be equal, but it's kind of interesting that they all exist and seem to agree with each other. Now, before I explain the resolution of this, let me just briefly comment on the gravitational dressing because we've been having so much fun fighting about it this week. Um, to define these operators gauge invariantly, I'm going to take I'm going to use a particular prescription, um, which I guess I first read about in a paper by Idsa Heemskirk. I'm not sure how, how far back it goes, um, but the idea is to shoot a space-like geodesic from the boundary in for some renormalized distance, orthogonal, you know, orthogonal to the boundary sphere, and then stick this operator at the end of it. Um, what that amounts to doing is computing in Pfefferman gram gauge when you're doing perturbation theory. But it's, it's sort of a little better defined than that because Pfefferman gram gauge can have caustics. But, but the way I describe the operator here, it's clearly fine. Um, so, so, but this is the analog of this axial gauge that Dan was talking about for electromagnetism, where you shoot a Wilson line out. 
Now, okay, non-trivial fact. Um, I haven't found the best way to prove this yet. Unfortunately, the way I proved it was I computed some awful six by six matrix of Dirac brackets. Um, but true fact, um, in to all orders in perturbation theory, this operator commutes with uh, local boundary operators that aren't sitting on top of the dressing geodesic. In electromagnetism, that's obvious uh, because the Wilson line just doesn't have support anywhere else. Here it's not obvious because the geodesic could go anywhere in principle, okay? So, so it's, a, it's a perturbative statement, uh, at least as far as I can tell. Um, if you, you know, the, 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 the matrix you invert does have derivatives in this direction and it requires some miraculous cancellation for those to not turn into tails um, out here. Okay, but true statement. So what that means is that according to bulk perturbation theory, we shouldn't, what we want isn't really an operator that commutes with everything. We want an operator that commutes with all local operators except for the one at this point, okay? And now the question is, is that enough to get us out of this kind of trouble? Um, well, intuitively it shouldn't be. It pr seems like it shouldn't be. So let me, let me, just, let me just make that more precise. Um, so, okay. Um, well, there's a more rigorous version of what I'm about to say, but let me just declare that an operator that commutes with all local operators except for here is a local operator here, okay? You can try and justify that more formally using what's called hog duality. Uh, but, okay, I don't want to bore everyone with algebraic quantum field theory, so let's just say it's true. This is a local operator here. Um, but now that's inconsistent with bulk causality in the following way. So say we've got this operator here in the center, and we've dressed it over to here. Um, now, conjecture. It's a local operator in the CFT here. But that's impossible because there's an operator here in the boundary which is, which is causally separated from this point but is space-like separated from this point. So in the CFT, these two operators would have to commute, but in the bulk, they can't. So that's a contradiction. And that, that, that extends this argument uh, to all orders in 1 over n. Um, OK. Um, so that's as much as I wanted to say on the bulk side. I'm now going to try and convince you that quantum error correction is clearly the solution to all of these problems. Um, but first, any, any more questions, complaints, uh, emotional sentiments? <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, what is quantum error correction? It's this thing that quantum information theorists invented because they want to build quantum computers. Um, and when you're trying to build a quantum computer, there's this annoying decoherence business um, that wants to destroy your memory, um, and you want to uh, protect yourself um, from that. Yeah? Is it, are you saying that there's a theorem here, that if that operator commutes with all the local operators, that it really is supported at that point? Um, well, are you asking specifically about the subtlety that we were discussing before? I'm asking about this epsilon here. Yeah, I yeah, I figured that was what you were asking about. Yeah, I think so. Well, so I, th I think that's okay because, so I, well, maybe let's discuss it afterwards because it's a little bit technical. But I, roughly, I think there's an e to the minus 1 over n squared in the, th in the discussion we were having, and that's not big enough to avoid the time slice axiom. So it, do, it, do, it doesn't have to do with the epsilon. It has to do with the e to the minus n squared. So you say there's a theorem that if it commutes well, theorem the is such a strong operators. Theorem is such a strong word in continuum quantum field theory. I think it follows from some from some set of assumptions. I'm not sure how it follows from this one because you have an epsilon here. But it's any epsilon. Yeah, but that's different from the epsilon equals zero. Right? It could go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Yeah, but I think I think that's not enough. Um, but but yeah, I'd, I'd rather not. I mean. I think I can say more about it, but I, time is limited, so let's discuss it afterwards. Um. This particular addressing you, that you use in order to make it local makes it have uh, probably infinite uh, energy, right? Um. You can smear it out. I mean, I, I, bulk operators are always smeared. I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I learned from. Yeah, I just think uh, it means the thickness you, of the string. You're putting in a very unusual gravitational field from this thing. Oh, you're worried about the thickness of the gravitational Wilson line? Yeah, so you should probably smear that a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, but but that's. I mean, it's okay if if, if I give you a little profile around here where it, where it's localized to there. That's not going to save you from this because this misses by order one. Okay. Um, all right. So good. So now um, quantum error correction. So uh, 
So one, one nice way of formulating quantum error correction is to say, you know, I want to send you some, some quantum state in the mail, um, but, you know, there have been, uh, you know, the, the Tea Party has been in power for a while, and there have been budget cuts, and the post office isn't once what it once was. Uh, so I'm worried about the state that I want to send to you. It might get a little corrupted uh, by, uh, by incompetence at the post office. Um, so is there something I can do to protect it? Well, if it were a classical state, there's an obvious thing I can do to, yes? Um, is this the, a political the, comment? No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, before you, you had this nice, um, you, you reviewed for us this conversation you had with a senior physicist about the time slice axiom. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering if you had a similar conversation about this weaker version. Um, I did, actually, and he felt similarly. Yeah. yeah. How do you say it? That's a sociological. Uh, <laughs> th th this is like how arguments go in philosophy conferences, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a reason to uh, make up your mind about this. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So, so, so if I wanted to send you a classical state, there's a stupid way of doing it, which is I just send you a hundred copies of the of the of the string of, of bits. Uh, and then even if you lose some of them, you can do majority rule. You know, even if you, some are corrupted or lost, you can still reconstruct the message. Now, with a quantum state, there's the no cloning theorem. So I can't just turn it into 100 copies and send them all to you. Um, but there's still something clever I can do, which is called quantum error correction. Um, so I'm going to give you a simple example uh, to explain this. So say I, say I want to send you a state psi, um, which is some state in the Hilbert space of a single qtrit. So a qtrit is like a three-state qubit. OK, so that's, that's the state I want to send you. Um, now, the idea is that um, rather than sending you one qtrit, I send you three. So it, st it still uses this idea of redundancy, but it uses it in a way that doesn't violate the no cloning theorem. Um, so what I do is I instead send you a state psi tilde, um, um, where these I tilde is a basis for some three-dimensional subspace of the 27-dimensional Hilbert space of three qtrits. Okay? Now, which subspace? Uh, here's the subspace. It can't just be any subspace, so we've got to pick one. This will be the most boring part of the talk. Okay, so, so there are all these sort of G, GHZ kind of states, if you know what that means. Um, and then the last one, um, okay, 0 to 1, um, 1, 0, 2, 2, 1, 0. Okay. So, so, so I send it to you, and I, I, I pick this to be my, my three-dimensional subspace. Now, why would I do something like that? Well, so first of all, notice these states are all very entangled. Um, and, and in fact, um, that entanglement leads to the nice property that um, if you look at any state in this subspace and you look at the reduced density matrix on any one of the qtrits, uh, it's maximally mixed. So it has, it has no information whatsoever about the state. Uh, and that's good because that means that maybe you can reconstruct the state from the other two without violating the no cloning theorem. Um, indeed, you can. Um, why can you? Well, the reason is because there exists um, a unitary transformation uh, let's say u12, so a unitary transformation acting just on the first two of the qtrits, um, with the property that if I act on it with one of these i tildes, I act on one of these i tildes with it, um, then I get back i on the first qtrit times some state chi on the second two, um, where chi is just some some other maximally mixed state. Um, Okay, so okay, homework problem. Find find the U12, but I, I promise you it exists. Um, and this is great. The reason is, you know, say say that now, you know, I send you the state, but the third Qtrit gets left behind in the post office. Um, well, you've still got, but you got the first two. If you if you only got the first one, you're screwed because then the state is maximally missed in your SOL. Um, but if you get two, well, what you can do is you can take you can take the state and you can act on it with U12. Um, and after you do that, well, you just get back psi on the first qtrit uh, times chi on second two. Um, so you get the state back uh, in your hands. Um, and the nice thing about this, right, is that these states are totally symmetric 
between the three Q traits. So if I can do this with the first two, I can also do it with two and three or with one and three, which means that I can recover the state from any two of the Q traits. Now, that should start sounding familiar you know, com compared to, to what we had um, up there. Um, but let, let me make the, the resemblance even more explicit. Um, OK, so, um, so, so, so here I was talking about recovering states. Here I was talking about the actions of operators. So that's the thing I want to I bridge. So indeed, so say, say that O is some operator on a single Q trait. So, so it acts um, uh, like that, okay? Just some, some arbitrary single Q trait operator. Now, there will always exist an operator O tilde, um, which acts on this, you know, a three Q trait operator in general, which acts with the same matrix elements on, on the protected subspace of the three Q traits. Um, but in general, so this would be true for any subspace that I picked. Um, but if I just pick some stupid subspace, then this O tilde would have support non-trivially on all three of the Q traits, and I, I wouldn't be able to avoid that. Um, but actually, because I wasn't stupid, and, and I, or more accurately, quantum information people like Dan Gottesman, picked um, these particular states, um, so then I'm in good shape, because I can define O12 as follows. I first act with U12 to decode the message. Then I act with O just on the first Q trait, uh, and then I put it back. Um, and now this is some operator who has support only on the first two Q traits, but, but implements an arbitrary operation on the protected subspace. Okay? And clearly, clearly there also exists um, O13 um, or O23. Um, and now it's exactly what we had here, right? So we had some, we had some, some you know, different choices of operators uh, on the different things that are all implementing the same uh, action on the state. Um, now, um, let me also comment. So, so say, say now that I look um, between two s states in the code subspace, um, psi and chi, um, at the commutator of O tilde, with some, with some arbitrary operator x, um, say where that operator acts on the first Q trait, um, some arbitrary operator on the first Q trait. Well, this O tilde is always acting either to the left or to the right on the code subspace. Um, so I can replace it by O23 at no cost in this equation, um, but now it's zero. Uh, so, so what we've achieved is that in some sense, we have a non-trivial operator, and where this could be an arbitrary operator on the code subspace, but we've arranged for it to commute with all single Q-trait operators, right? So by symmetry, I could have dealt with X2 or X3 in the same way. Um, now, okay, there was a theorem, so I'm obviously not violating the theorem. The reason why I'm not violating the theorem is because this equation is true only in this um, subspace of states, o only, only in this subspace. Um, so I claim that that's the lesson, uh, the lesson, um, for ADS-CFT um, is that we should only think um, of the algebra, the bulk algebra of operators um, acting on the subspace. So I'm um, not quite sure what you want to do here. I mean, the bulk algebra operator would suggest that these things you want to construct with the gravitational tails commute with all the local observables in the boundary. Yeah, up they to, would also up, up to the put one over in. Uh, yeah, up to the the part, up to the stress tensor at the end yes, of the dress. Yes, yes. Yeah. But would also say they commute with products of local observables on the node. Um, to some extent, no, not eventually, right? I mean, they are eventually made out of sums of products of local operators, right? So they can't commute with all of them, right? So the, phi the, and phi the dot at the same algebra, the same argument you gave based yeah. on bulk algebra to show that you know your operator commutes with, let's say, most of the local operators. Yeah. You certainly show that it commutes. Exactly in the same sense, everywhere in one we're in, with you know products of five local operators. Uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. Well, no, so remember the the issue here is when you say the commutator is zero, what do you mean by that, right? So I didn't. So the what, the lesson we learned before was that we shouldn't interpret it as a, as an unrestricted operator equation. Um, I'm just pointing out that... So, and that, that's consistent with what I'm saying here, right? The kind of causality hit from the bulk. Yeah. Okay. 
at each order of one over n. Yeah. Whatever those equations mean. Yeah. Give you zero for the commutators, not only with a single local operator boundary, but with products of five or seventeen local operators. Um. Uh, yeah. Right. And, that's true. And you know you chosen the single Q-thread operators or single trace operators to be special here. They're the ones that get to be... Oh, well, yeah, that's a exactly good, 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 good. So that's that's because this model only has three Q-treads. So I'm not going to... I can't really talk... I mean, there's not much bigger than one except all of them, right? So I'm going to give a model where we're going to see it works like what you're saying. Oh, where even products of those local guys yes. have zero properties. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trying to understand, maybe I'm missing something, but uh, to what extent is this a problem just with, say, three scalar fields in the bulk? You know, there you have the different steering functions, you have the statements about... Uh, um, in the bulk, these are just, equi you mean just in the, per the, the free Fox space in ADS? Yeah. These operators are all equal. So they're all equal? Yeah. With the, the different Rindler... Um, the different Rindler ones are all equal. They're oh, just okay. Bogolubov transformations. Okay. That's where you yeah, say the interactions have... Okay. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the states where they're going to not be equal, I'm eventually going to tell you what they are. But it's not going to be low energy states where there's just a few quanta hanging okay, around. Okay, but you will explain that. I will hopefully explain that, yes. Okay. I apologize if this question is premature, but it seems like here you found something that was a little stronger than you wanted based on the... The dressing? Based on the tails. Um, of that, that's, that's true. That's, a, that's an embarrassing uh, question. I'm afraid I don't have too much to say about it. I mean, so, so you know, I think uh, that doesn't... It, that, that's right that here, here, here it's stronger, but I mean, this model does not, it doesn't have diffeomorphisms in the bulk or a Hamiltonian, right? So, so, so I think it just is not good enough to, to capture that aspect of ADS CFT. And unfortunately, the other model I'm going to give isn't going to capture it either. So, yeah, I, good question. The fact that the commutator that you wrote before um, should be zero only within a class of states, isn't it obvious from the fact that uh, if you set, insert the uh, order n squared operators in the correlator, they would back react on the geometry and change the background. Um, so you I, I'm going to gonna comment on that. So y yes, that's going to be part of it. But let's, let me be clear that not all back reaction screws this up. So for example, you can easily you can easily put in a planet, okay? And you know you might say, well, if there's a planet there, why are you using this smearing function that you derived in the vacuum? Um, but there's a resolution to that, which is not a new resolution. It's a resolution that goes back to the 30s, where in quantum electrodynamics, if you have a heavy, heavy charged particle and a light charged particle, um, and you're studying scattering at low energies, then um, the Feynman diagram uh, expansion is bad. And the reason is because there's this thing called the hydrogen atom. And so the way you deal with that is there's an infinite class of diagrams you need to sum up, which I think are called beta and saltpeter. <laughs> Um, well, I think that's the maybe that's the equations that are obeyed by the diagrams. But 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 what you find is that the those diagrams build up a classical electric field. Um, so so you can interpret instead of doing that hard work of resumming that infinite class of diagrams, you can just study the propagation of the electron in the background of the electric field sourced by the proton, and it's the same operator. I mean, it, it, you know, it, you, you don't say, oh, it's you, you, you know. So so you just you see it by resumming. So, so here, the, the, to see that in Kabat, Lifshitz, and Lowe, it would be the same story. So the diagrams are the same. And you have, sometimes you have to resum an infinite subclass of the diagrams to see that the background got corrected. Um, so that level of back reaction, I think, is included in these things. Now, there's a deeper level of back reaction having to do with black holes. That was my point, too. And I think I'm going to classify what you said as my point, too, which is that, of course, because of black holes, all this stuff can't really be true, and there's an N squared involved. So I'm just trying to sharpen that. And, and I should say, I should say, moreover, that um, this idea about you know algebras acting on subspaces is something that these guys have been talking about, and, and that that is the thing that got us started started thinking about it. So, yeah. <coughs> okay. Can you explain? You said twice now that these things in the bulk theory, these are bulk Lubov transformations of each other. Yeah. Can you explain what? What are the two different bulk operators you're talking well, about? No, so in the, in the bulk, it's the same operator, right? You have, a, you have a free field, and you can expand it in whichever set of complete basis of modes that you like. So you can either use the ones that have, you know, spherical harmonic times radial wave function, or you can use the ones that have support in this Rindler wedge and that Rindler wedge. And if you use the, and if you use the ones that just have support in this Rindler wedge, then with the, diction, the ADS-CFT dictionary turns that into an operator here, whereas if you do it in another wedge, it turns it into an operator here. But, but from the point of view of the Fox space, they just have the same matrix elements, equal operators. Um, so, so, Dan, so the, the construction that you gave depended on choosing this code subspace in kind of a clever way with these GHC states. Good. So we're going to discuss that. 
Are you setting the CFT rule yes. somehow automatically? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. If you like, it's because low energy states of conformal field theories are very entangled. They have long range entanglement to make contact with the other workshop. Oh. Yeah. And, and the, we'll see that explicitly in the model that I described. Um, okay, so now let, let, me, let me try and keep going here. So, okay, so, so far I just described a model. Um, I, obviously the idea is to download this idea into ADS CFT, but we're gonna need to generalize the idea to do it. Now there's a beautiful general theory of quantum error correction, which I don't have time to explain to you. Let me just tell you one result from it, which is all that we're gonna need. So, so say that I have n qubits, um, and I wanna have, uh, so n total qubits, and I have k protected qubits. Um, so meaning that the code subspace will be dimension two to the k out of a total two to the n dimensional Hilbert space, but it'll be some you know, entangled subspace. It won't be some stupid subspace. And then say I want to, uh, then say I'm gonna erase l qubits, l erased qubits. Um, then um, a necessary and basically sufficient condition for this u to exist um, is that n needs to be large um, compared to, uh, to uh, 2L plus K. Um, if, if you want to talk about, if you want to be more precise, then errors are of order two to the, um, two to the minus N minus 2L minus K, okay? Um, so, so this is sort of when you should think that error correction makes sense. Um, so the statement is that this is always, this is necessary, and that if, this, if the subspace is chosen randomly, it's sufficient. Okay, so that, that, that's the basic story. This is quite intuitive. If you want to send a bigger message or you want to protect against more erasures, you need more qubits. Okay, now let's go back to ADS-CFT. Um, so I'm just gonna, so you know, we had some general description of how to define various <coughs> kinds of code subspaces in ADS-CFT. Uh, so there, there's no unique code subspace. There, you can define various code subspaces and you can ask which operators can I reconstruct on which subregions depending which code subspace I pick. Um, I'll just pick a simple one, which is I take, I take some region in the center of the bulk whose size is of order one in ADS units, okay? Um, and then now I'm gonna define the code subspace, so sort of following uh, Kuryakos and Suvarat, um, by just by, by taking the vacuum and then acting with local operators. Uh, inside this region. Um, and then the idea is that, um, you know, I act with of order K. So this, not necessarily all in the same place, uh, you know, we're all the same operator, but just heuristically I act with of order K. Um, and now the question is, um, uh, what does that inequality tell me about when I can and can't reconstruct uh, these operators on subregions? So um, let's first take K to be order one. So then what this tells us is that we need more than half of the boundary, right? Um, and that's basically right. That's what, the, that's what the Rindler reconstruction tells you too. It tells you that you need more than half of the boundary to, to reconstruct these guys in the center. Um, Excuse me. Uh, the interesting thing to do is though, is to start cranking okay. up. Okay. Yeah. Question. Uh, erased qubits means that you know which qubits. Yes, erasure are. channel always. Yeah, but uh, then it seems the, the bound should be n greater than L plus K, not 2L plus K? Um, no, I don't think so. This, this is the quantum singleton bound. Maybe we have a notation issue here, but I promise you this is correct. Uh, but uh, in your example, uh, N is three, K is one, and L is one, right? Sorry, sorry in, in which? In the example you just raised. Um, so, in the, so there it's saturated because, because it's a perfect code. So in spe is if it, so I said it, I said uh, yeah so so the the necessary condition is that this is greater than or equal to, and 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 so so if you think think about the five qubit code, yeah okay the five qubit code has n equals five, um, and k equals one and you can correct two erasures. Ah, uh, two er yeah 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 thank you yeah. Um, so, so, no, so now the interesting thing to do is to start ramping up K and ask, you know, okay, when are we going to get into trouble with this uh, inequality? Um, when, when is the answer going to stop being a half? Um, and so this was already anticipated by Kuryakos. So first we have to decide what, so clearly it's going to be when K is of order little n. You, no? you just translate the CFT into qubits, right? So I, I'm about to describe that. 
Just well, in the oh, you, you said you said you need more than. But more I have to figure out what's little n. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. so so I'm, I'm now going to tell you what's little n. So so obviously in the CFT uh, the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. Um, uh, so this inequality doesn't look very helpful. But recall that um, I picked these operators to be in the center. Uh, I've picked a conformal frame, so the center is well defined. Um, and the smearing functions of operators that are in the center <coughs> vary smoothly over the sphere, okay? which means that the short distance uh, physics in the CFT is not helpful. It doesn't play a role in reconstructing these operators. So, so from the point of view of n scaling, the only thing that I really have available is the matrices. You know, maybe I have some angular momentum modes up to some large order one number like a million, but nothing involving n. Um, so uh, uh, nothing involving capital N. So if we were doing uh, you know, n equals 4 super Yang mills theory to be precise, then we should think of n as being like capital N squared, just at the level of scaling. That's the number of degrees of freedom we have available in the CFT for trying to reconstruct these operators. Um, but then you see now we're in good shape. So we see that once k becomes of order n squared, then we start losing the ability to, to reconstruct on half of the system. Um, and as Kuriako said, uh, that's good because that's exactly in the bulk when we think acting with all of these guys is going to start running into the holographic bound. Um, and it's going to turn it into a giant black hole. Okay. So, so, so the claim is that now we've finally made contact with point two um, that was sitting down here. And we've seen that it's consistent. So we've seen that the CFT is allowed to sort of realize the bulk algebra to the extent that it needs to, um, but not more. Um, now, I just want to close by showing a few pictures and describing a little the work with, with Fernando, who unfortunately has had to sit here for an hour and not hear about his, his work. Um, so, so, okay. So, unfortunately, you know, I give, so other than deriving that inequality, I'm afraid that most of the things I said were actually derived in the bulk. Um, so, so, if you like, I have a cartoon of what's happening in the CFT, and everything I know about the bulk is consistent with that cartoon. Um, I mean, that's nice, but of course it would be good if we could see explicitly in the CFT that this is actually what's going on. Now, you know, we are weak, uh, so... I can't show you that you know, in full glory. Um, I showed it to you in some stupid model where you could see explicitly what was going on. But we could ask, is there a model like that, which is more like the CFT, which captures more of the features? Uh, so there, the answer is yes. So you know, we, in our paper, we said there, there should be some model like this. I went to Caltech, and I gave a talk, and I said, there should be some model like this. And then Fernando and Benny sent me an email that night, and they said, we've got your model. <laughs> So, 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 uh, so let me just say a little bit about the model, which I should say, I mean, you know, the lion's share of what we know about the model was derived by Fernando and Benny. Um, so, and this will just be the last five minutes. Um, so, so uh, true fact. There exist tensors um, with an even number of indices, 2n indices, uh, all indices having the same range with the property that any bipartition of the tensor into half and half is a unitary transformation. Not obvious fact, but true fact. Uh, actually, you can, you can construct such tensors from, from error-correcting codes. <coughs> so in particular, there's a six-index such tensor where, where the ingoing legs are two-dimensional. So it, you can think of it as a unitary map from three qubits to, to, to three qubits but it's unitary whichever way you choose to run the legs. Um, now, so here, here's an example of such a tensor. Um, now, this tensor has the property, therefore, that if I have an operator um, that's acting on any three of the legs, um, I can replace it by a different operator acting on the other three. Um, and this is not rocket science. Um, what happened here was that O prime was just uh, T dagger T on O. Um, uh, so, 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 of course, that's true for any unitary. The, the nice thing here is that I can do it from any three legs to any other three legs. Um, now, 
Um, that's nice because it lets us push. So, so now the idea is to make a tensor network by contracting these tensors together in some grandiose way. And then we'll be able to move operators around in the network by using this operation. And in particular, operators in the bulk, we can try and push out to the boundary and then see explicitly how they're realized as operators in the boundary qubits. Um, so, so now we get to the audiovisual uh, part of the talk. Um, See if I can uh, improve this. So here's a fun picture. So so here's some here's some pentagon tiling of the hyperbolic plane. Okay. So so e e you know just uh, e each guy here is a pentagon. You know pentagons don't usually look like that. Um, but actually, so I, I just couldn't resist doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take I'm going to take this tiling. Um, ah, stop. Okay. And I'm I'm going to stick one of these six index tensors in the middle of each of the pentagons. I'm going to send five of the legs out through the edges to be contracted with the other pentagons, and then I'm going to leave one free at each pentagon. Um, so we can illustrate that. Watch this. <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop, stop. <laughs> okay. And, you know, just for fun, we can... Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, so now, right, so, so now then the idea is going to be we're going we're gonna to run this procedure out for some, for some, you know, large number of layers. We'll stop, that'll be the cutoff, and then we'll shoot all the remaining legs out. And then the way I'm going to interpret that um, is that it's a it's a map from the it's a linear map from the dangling bulk legs to the outgoing boundary legs, um, and in fact it's going to be an isometry. So 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 uh, it preserves the inner product. So I, if I send in so there's some complete basis of the boundary legs that I can send out send in, and I'll get out some complete basis of the boundary legs. Uh, sorry, not complete basis. I'll get out a, a, a basis for a subspace mm -hmm. of the boundary legs. Okay. Now, how big is the subspace? So this you can compute. Fun fact: uh, if you compute the ratio of the number of bulk legs to the number of boundary legs, and you take the large um, n limit, uh, the ratio is one over square root of five. This is not that surprising. It's five <laughs> pentagons. I don't think it would be six if you did hexagons, though. Um, so okay, so so that means that you get an exponentially small subspace. So th what this is real, what this network is really doing is it's defining an exponentially small subspace of the boundary Hilbert space. Okay, and my claim is going to be that this subspace is caricaturing the low energy states of the conformal field theory, the states whose energy is less than n squared. Okay, these are going to be the states where there are just local perturbations here and there. Okay, um, now. Great. So now we can have some fun. So um, let's see. Uh, okay. So here's here's another. Uh, get this. Uh, okay. So so he, so here's here so here's Fernando's version of this picture. Or maybe did you make this or did Benny? I think you made it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the same picture. So right the, here, here's the tensor and it's got the five legs going out. So, so a picture like this is a state at a given time, is that? Um, yeah. Uh, right. This is defining a state in the Hilbert space of the CFT. That's right. So there, embarrassing fact, there are no dynamics in this model. So sue me. Um, the CFT is the white dots? The CFT is the white dots. dots. Yeah, the, yeah, the CFT is the Hilbert space of all the white dots. And we're talking about some subspace of the states, which are, which are gotten as the image of this isometry. There are fewer red dots than white dots? Yeah, that was the square root of 5. So the number of red dots over the white dots is 1 over square root of 5. So, so, so it's an exponentially small fraction of the Hilbert space. And the perturbation is changing one of these... Good. So yeah. So ne good. So so roughly, I'll describe the ground state by sending in all zeros to all of the red dots. Now you could complain that that's a product state and that's ridiculous. But remember that you should think of these as being of order ADS size, and and, and ADS is a gapped system. So so it's true that there's correlation here and here, but it's exponentially small. So I've just thrown that out. Okay. 
So, and then to make an excitation, now I act with an operator on, on one of these, and that's like acting with the local operator. Okay, so now we're in shape. We're in good shape because we can we can move. We can use the pushing to to do uh, Kabat Lifshitz and Low. Here's how it works. So I take take some operator acting. So here I drew the dangling leg, and then you see I can push it. So I can replace this by one two three, and I can keep going one two three one two three one two three. I can keep going, and eventually this will be represented as some 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 boundary operator, which is in a subregion. Okay. And similarly, if I'd done it with this one here, it would be in some, some smaller subregion. And moreover, this is clearly not unique, right? So I, I could have chosen to send this one that way. And now I would have gotten a representation going this way. Uh, so, so, so I claim that this is, just ident this is the realization of the ADS Rindler um, reconstruction in this model. OK, so so far we've reproduced things that we already knew about ADS CFT. And what happens if you're not dealing with the ground state of some excited state? <clears throat> That's fine. So this map works on the entire subspace. Because you notice, I, I, always, I, I, ne I always leave two of these free. Uh -huh. So I can view the dangling one as the third input when I do the pushing. Okay. So, so I can send an arbitrary state into the input of each of these. And I can still get the same operator in the boundary. So, so yeah. Um, Question. Yeah. Is there a privileged uh, or preferred global representation of uh, centered operator? Um, well, yeah, so there's a simple thing you can do, which is that you can just say that the entire network defines an isometry, and you can just st you can shoot the, pass the operator through that isometry. So that's like the global representation. But, and, and, and these different representations will not be equal in the larger Hilbert space, but by construction, they'll be equal on the code subspace, on the low energy subspace. Yes? So the the map is obviously such that this thing in the middle is represented as a sum of the operators on the boundary. Um, well, sum is, uh, sums in products. I mean, because the, the, these indices are all being contracted everywhere, right? So it, it's so giving it's sums and <coughs> yeah, sums and products. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Actually, there's spe there's special choices where it's only products, but I, I would say that's that should be the general lesson. <coughs> Kind of in the spirit of trying to reconstruct the bulk without making any assumptions, can you? I'm tempted to interpret your your lesson here as as a new argument for the need for a UV completion of gravity that involves these states uh, that you need in which the operators are not the identity. Um, um, is that? Well, yeah, you could probably say. Well, I, I'm not sure how to. Th what, what are you taking ADS-CFT as an input or an output in making well, that I statement? Well, I thought you wanted make it as much of an output as you can. Um, I mean, I don't. Uh, so you need these state, you need it only. I mean, so, but I mean, I used ADS-CFT to get myself into trouble, right? I used the fact that the boundary theory was a Lorentzian variant quantum field theory. So, so if I, if I, I, I could fantasize that there's some other, you know, loop I'm just, I'm just saying that you need more states than the states for which it needs to look like uh, geometry. Uh, yeah, if ADS-CFT <laughs> is correct, then that's true. I need, I need the black holes. It, it can't, ADS-CFT can't be consistent without the black holes. You there, could interpret isn't that really as really a reduction in the number of states. Because you're saying that yes, it yeah. Grows like and, yeah, and, I mean, and moreover, I mean, just just to give credit where credit is due, I mean, this is not a surprise, right? I mean, we already knew that the free energy <laughs> go, uh, at high temperature in the CFT goes like the area, not like the volume. So, I mean, so, so I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I didn't just discover that black holes are needed. I mean, this is of course Juan knew that uh, immediately, probably. I know, I know. I'm just asking if yeah. it's a different argument for things we already. Yeah, it, it is. So yeah, so yeah, so far, yeah, so so far, I've been giving you sort of different arguments for things we already know. I was now going to try and tell you something that maybe you didn't already know. And I was going to close with that. Um, so, so that thing has to do with this business of the causal wedge versus the entanglement wedge. So did anyone give a talk about that last week? I don't know. Is that? Well, OK. So here, here's some thing about the, the causal wedge versus the entanglement wedge. So, 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 so in this model, so in general, these two things are different even for connected regions. But in the model, I have to take the regions connected for them to be different. So the idea is the causal wedge. So I take A to be this union of these two things. And now if, if A is sufficiently small, then, um, then the Rutaki Nagi surface is the union of these two things. This is the, this is the minimal area extremal surface because, because these surfaces are bigger. Okay? Um, and then so the entanglement wedge defined by Mukin and Veronica and Matt and Albion, and maybe by Aaron Wall also too, I'm not sure. Um, uh, is, is sort of you, you, you sort of interpolate between the boundary and the and the and the Rutaki Nagi surface, 
with some spatial surface, and then you take its bulk domain of dependence. That's the entanglement wedge. So here, here it's just equal to the causal wedge in the vacuum. But now if I make the regions bigger, then the minimal area surface switches, right? Because the, these two start being smaller. And now the entanglement wedge also contains this whole region. And so, so it was conjectured by these people that operators here should also be reconstructible in A, um, e e even though uh, Dan Kabat can't tell you how to do it. Um, and uh, there are various arguments for this. My, my favorite argument is that if you look at the, at the order one correction to Rutakinagi, which is derived by Faulkner, Lukwitz, and Maldasena, it tells you that the bulk entanglement <coughs> entropy everywhere in the entanglement wedge contributes to the entanglement entropy of a boundary region. Um, and so you can imagine I put in some spin in a mixed state here. You know, maybe I purify it by some spin over here. And they would tell you that the entanglement entropy of A has to increase by log 2 if I do that. And the only way I can see that happening, although this isn't a proof, is that if there's some operator here that projects onto one state or the other of the spin. So, so to me, that's the, the best argument um, for, for, for entanglement wedge reconstruction. Um, but you know, from the, in, in the CFT, we don't know how to do it. OK. Now, the point is, in the model, we know how to do it. Um, and so coming back to the same nope. thing before you go on, I'm always confused in this discussion is whether you now are talking about reconstructing the table of edge in the CFT at finite in, or from this one over n expansion you were talking about before, which is where you saw causality in the bulk. Um, so remember, so when, when I'm so I'm I am always thinking at finite n because my subspace is defined using n. So at infinite n, all that's left are states whose energy is less than n squared, and that's the limit where these oper things all hold us operator equations. So it, it's the it's the states who, which, of large energy that are not in the code subspace. There are interesting states of energy order n squared even as n goes to infinity. Yes, that's right. Those are very important. Yes, absolutely. So, it's, so, so saying that things hold in a subspace with energy order n squared. No, no, but I, I explain. Saying that you get operator identities on the entire Hilbert yes, space. Yes, that's the point. That's the whole point. Okay. Yes, yes. And it's too much to ask for operator identities on the whole Hilbert space. Because if you think about the, you know, imagine some operator that you dressed operator that you stuck in the center of the vacuum. And now let's just consider a state where there's a gigantic black hole whose, you know, whose whose uh, radius is 10 to the 500 times the ADS radius. I wouldn't necessarily expect the operator to make per particularly much sense, and I maybe not, wouldn't also necessarily expect it to commute with local operators. That's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's what happens in this model. I mean, that's exactly what happens in this model. But your model was designed to model. It has the black these, holes too. I'll explain it. These, oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. It has the black I'll holes too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah continue abusing the time allotted to me. Um, so here's how we do entanglement wedge reconstruction. So you see, here's a, so instead of you know, r running this one this way, I run it that way. And now you see I've reconstructed the central operator on, on, a, on a union of two regions where you can prove, although I won't explain it to you, that just with this region or just with that region, you have no information about this operator. And, and the reason is because if you, just took, if you looked at just this region, on its complement, I can reconstruct this and vice versa for this region. So by the no cloning theorem, either one separately has no information. So it's the entanglement between these two regions that you need to allow you to reconstruct this. So I would say this is evidence for the entanglement wedge uh, reconstruction hypothesis. Now, let me just close by saying briefly about how the black holes work. So. So of course, in ADS CFT, all states in the CFT have physical interpretations. I certainly don't think that there are states in the CFT at finite n that don't have physical interpretations. Um, so how do I make it th that consistent with this fact that I think, uh, oh, you know, only these, sub these operators will work only on these subspaces? So I just said it to you in words, but let me show you how it works in the model. So, so, so remember, these are the low energy states. How do I get a bigger one? Um, well, the easiest thing to do, oh, this was just some example where the entanglement wedge is, is much bigger than the causal wedge, but okay. Here, so here, here's, here's how you make a black hole. The smallest black hole, I just remove the central tensor, and then I treat all five of these legs as input. Okay, so now I've replaced one input leg by five, and it's still an isometry, so I'm now looking at a larger subspace than I was before. But this actually includes the, the case of no black hole. I'm, I was about to say, so then I subtract that off. So, 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 so I, sub, I, sub, I direct subtract the state that I would have had before, and the rest of them I call black holes. Um, and then if I meant to make a bigger black hole, I make it, I, I remove more tensors, and I get more legs. So it, it's hopefully obvious that the entropy of these black hole states goes like the area. Um, 
Uh, and then um, if I keep going, right, then if I, if I do this process eventually, the sub, you know, more and more, the subspace is getting bigger and bigger. And eventually I've, encountered for the, I've, I've accounted for the entire boundary over space by, by considering large enough black holes. Um, so, but, then, but then it's clear, right, that, that once I do this, I've lost the ability to make the operator here. Right? And as it gets bigger, I lose more and more operators. Uh, and I, I claim that's correct. Um, yeah? So, Daniel, I, I would just prefer another set of words to what you just said. Please. Namely that when you look at the, the thing that you can consider a local excitation inside that region as compared to the black hole, mm -hmm. what you're doing is taking the Hilbert space of the black hole and imposing a constraint on it. Um, so you mean when I neglected the state that wasn't actually a black hole? Well, you said that one is not a black hole. Yeah, I mean, nominally I would use the Hamiltonian to decide that, but I happen to not have a Hamiltonian here, so right. I had to... But would, in an equivalent way, I think these words mean the same thing. Yeah. Is that you take this whole big Hilbert space uh -huh. and you put a constraint on it that defines this particular state you want to call not the black hole. Well, it's not just one state. It's a whole subspace of states. Yeah, but, yeah that's right. <coughs> subspace that's right. of states. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Your smallest black hole is ADS radius, I guess. That's right. So embarrassing fact, uh, sub-ADS locality is like not even part of this discussion at all. So I mean, everything I said here is morally true in the Ising model. Right. I mean, that, that, I think that's, that, there's a long list of aspects of ADS CFT that aren't in this model. I mean, we were trying to realize certain aspects uh, having to do with the structure of the entanglement. I mean, actually, actually, Fernando also has a beautiful proof that in states like these, you can show that the Rutakinagi formula holds exactly for connected regions which I didn't have time to talk about. That's also a nice property. Um, but uh, there are many, there are many uh, aspects which we uh, just don't have here. And, you know, I mean, what can I say? It's a toy model. If I included all the features, I'd be back to the CFT. And in higher dimensions, you just simply increase the number of legs for the, for the tensor? Um, yeah, yeah. So this is like, right. You, 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 right. I mean, the, the, it wouldn't be planar anymore. Yeah, but yes. Yeah, and so the cuts, right, the, like the, the Rutakinagi is defined in terms of cuts, and so that's still okay, but yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, with the, with the higher dimension ones, it's harder to do explicit calculations. Like, I mean, for example, here I can compute the, 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 the amount, the, the fraction of the boundary you need beyond which you can reconstruct the center analytically, right, whereas in, in, in a higher dimensional one, I might not be able to compute that. Maybe I could. I don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it's 5 plus square root of 5 divided by 10, which is 0.724. Um, the, the reason why it's not a half is related to another embarrassing property of these models, which is that translational invariance on the boundary is savaged. So you notice here that, that actually the, the subgroup of the rotation group that is preserved is Z5. <laughs> so, so, so whether or not I can reconstruct the center on a, on a boundary interval depends not only on the size but also on where it is. So, so, for example, the, the best case reconstruction is 52%, and the worst case is 72%. <laughs> yeah. Is it reasonable to ask for a large N version of this model? So we could, in principle, test other aspects, like the uh, Utakianagi for disconnected regions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you can, so one obvious thing to do is to increase the range of the indices. So, 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 so the, the, the entropy you get in Rutakinagi, the coefficient is like log of the range of the indices. So, so morally, you should think of these as being like 2 to the n instead of 2. Um, uh, it's not to, to get, but when you, when you do that, you have to be a little subtle. It's subtle because you want to preserve this property that you can push things through, through the tensors. Um, so, and, and you know, and you don't like you have to. You also have to be careful about increasing the number of legs, right? Because you you want to preserve that the radius of curvature of the graph is order one. So, so yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I I, I would like to somehow know how to turn this into a controlled approximation of the CFT. That that is actually how condensed matter physicists try and use tensor networks, uh, but but I don't know how to do it uh, here. I mean, there yeah. Presumably, you could do the same thing that condensed matter physicists do. You would need this large range of tensors, but the yeah. properties would not be manifest, like, as you said, the, the translation and the bulk locality and so on. Yeah, that's right. And they probably wouldn't be perfect tensors with this property that, I, that they're unitary in any bipartition. You don't actually need that. You just need them to be invertible, right? You just need them to be full rank, and that's enough to, to do this inversion. 
it, it's, it's more subtle because then orthogonal states don't get set to orthogonal states, but you can take the linear span of whatever it is that you do get, and then it's still true. But that's unitary bulk operators and unitary bound. Right, unitary don't map to, don't unitary map to that's right. correct. Yeah, so you'd have to think, that, yeah, right. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing you'd have to worry about. That's right. Um, I think the act as unitary is in the subspace. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I think that, right. that's right. probably true. Right. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, that's right. But so if we took random tensors, let's say we have a lot of indices. Yeah, so, so we thought about that. I think Brian and she and Ahmed were working on that. I'm not sure what the, the late. I mean, so so it's not. Tr so at first I thought that. Like exponentially close to. No, so good. I thought I th I first thought that random tensors would be exponentially close to being perfect tensors if I increase the, the range of indices, but that's false. Because 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 you're right on the edge of page, right? You're half and half. So you know, so you don't get. I mean, page you win by being a little bit over half, but here it's exactly half and half. So it's it's sort of order one. It's like sort of order one close to being a perfect tensor, but not like good. Like not like you know uh, parametrically close. Yeah, Aram Harrow straightened me out about this. Okay. Other comments? Thanks a lot. And then, uh, those interested in hiking and dinner, let's meet out in the courtyard and figure out the details.